Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. It is uh, wonderful to have you here because you're one of my favorite people to watch on a debate for two reasons. One, you sound like Mr. Mackey to me. I know. And yeah. two, your policies are progressive and, like, you think about kids, you, you, you have this idea of America that is, that is really attractive to many people. And that's what I wanted to start the conversation in and around. A lot of people may know you as someone who's on the edge of a debate stage. You know? A lot of people do know. Right. Yeah. They do, but... Right, you but... can't when it comes to policy and in the Senate and in running and writing laws for this country, many people regard you as a senatorial rock star. Why do you think that is? Maybe because the bar is as low as it is. In the <laughs> I, I, I... No. I don't think that's true. I don't think I, that's I true. Don't that's true. No, I really I'd, li I, I'd like to not think that's the reason. Uh, it's because... I believe fundamentally all of us have been sent there to make progress. We right. have to make progress. As my friend Lamar Alexander, who's a Republican, says, if you just want to stick to your opinion, you might as well stay home and be on the radio. There's right. no reason to come to the national legislature to do the work. And I... <laughs> and, and I have been able to do some things. You know, we re rewrote the Elementary and Secondary School Act. Nobody knows about that, but we got rid of No Child Left Behind. I've, written bills that have, that have dramatically changed the way the FDA approves drugs. And right. 140 new drugs have been approved as a result. And in 2013, with John McCain and some others, I wrote the immigration bill that Donald Trump seems to have completely forgotten that passed the Senate with 68 votes. And if we could just get back to that work, we could address the problem instead of trying to build an ineffective medieval wall. <laughs> let's, let's talk a little bit about about the writing of laws. These laws that you spoke about are genuinely monumental moments in American history. You know, reforming immigration is a giant thing. Changing education has so many, you know, speed bumps in the way. How do you begin to write laws with people who are on the other side of the aisle? Because there are many Republicans who go, Senator Bennett is a phenomenal person to work with and he knows how to write great laws. What do you think the secret is then? I think the secret is starting with the people at home and trying to align their priorities to the priorities in Washington and reminding people in Washington that those are the priorities, not the stuff on the cable television at night. You know, the Ameri our approval rating in the Senate, I take no pleasure, is 9%. And I used to walk through the airport in Denver when I got off the airplane wanting a paper bag over my head <laughs> because I was so embarrassed by the 9% approval rating that we had. Right. And wondering why in the world anybody would want to work in a place with a 9% approval rating. And there's an answer to that, which is if you think you've been sent there to dismantle the federal government, as the Freedom Caucus and others have, that 9% approval rating suits you. If you actually want to do stuff for the American people, this exercise in self-government, which is our exercise in self-government, not the politicians, it's the people in this audience, has to work. And so you look at something like that immigration bill, where eight of us sat in a room for seven months uh, uh, responding to each other's political needs, mm -hmm. and it worked. And if we just did the work the way those eight people did the work, we'd have a 75% approval rating, not a 9% approval rating, but more important than that, we'd be governing this country again, which is what we have to find a way to do. One of... One of your breakthrough moments in this run, undoubtedly, was a tweet that you recently sent out uh, that made waves, and we'll, we'll, we'll pull it up here. In the tweet, you say, if you elect me president, I promise you won't have to think about me for two weeks at a time. <laughs> I'll do my job watching out for North Korea and ending this trade war so you can go back to raising your kids and live your lives. Yeah. Yeah. That, is a, that is a really interesting pitch, because basically what you're saying is, vote for me, because I'll be boring and get the job done. Yeah, and, and it is a job. It's the most important job in the world, and we've got a reality TV star in the job. And he's... And that's no good, but he's happy to play that part every right. single day. And I think the American people would feel liberated if they could get up in the morning not wondering who the President of the United States was attacking by his tweets, not wondering who the President of the United States was trying to divide, but knowing that we had a President who was trying to unite our country and who actually was doing his job, which is important. If... If everything went your way, and you found yourself in the White House, you would now have 
what many consider the unenviable task of working with the Senate that may or may not be still including Mitch McConnell right. as, as running the show. Now, you, you work way, with him. You know why he can't do any of the gun stuff? It's because he's so busy trying to keep Russia from attacking our democracy. <laughs> I think that's, that's sarcasm. I think that's Sorry. sarcasm. Yeah. Um, but but, but it, it, it's no secret. Mitch McConnell has been extremely effective right. in yep. blocking yeah. many laws from yeah. being passed. Yeah. The next president, who could be a Democrat, would still maybe have to work with Mitch McConnell if you look at the Senate the way it is now. How would you begin that? Because he's still going to be there McConnell blocking things, so... <laughs> What would your plan be? By the way, I, I had to sign a release for my daughter, who's 15, to be here tonight. <laughs> and, and now I know why. It was... But it was the swearing Democrats. Yeah, too, it was actually the swearing could... Democrats, yeah. not me. Uh, look, here's... I, I, I want to be very clear about this, and everybody needs to understand this. We were broken before Donald Trump arrived. That's one of the reasons he was sent there. And... They didn't let Barack Obama get anything done in the legislature, in the Congress, for the last six years he was there. We have to fix that problem. And I would never say that we should be as malevolent or as cynical as Mitch McConnell is. He is the most malevolent and cynical person in Washington. But we do need to be as strategic as he is. And we have not been as strategic as as he has been over the last 10 years. So I think we got to take this agenda to the country. You got to go to places where you, the president, may never win 30% of the vote mm-hmm. or, 20, or 25% of the vote, but you're there to say, this is why we got to get universal health care done. Right. This is why we got to get background checks done. This is why we got to deal with climate. And I think that will make a difference. We got to d- make some reforms, too. You know, I mean, ideally, we'd end political gerrymandering in this country. Right. I. D- I, I d- I, I, ideally, we'd do something to overcome Citizens United. And I've had a bill for 10 years, which for a long time I couldn't get anybody to support, but it, it said that if you've had the privilege of serving as a member of the House and serving as a member of the Senate, you should accept a lifetime ban on ever becoming a lobbyist in Washington, D.C. Wow. And over half the people that leave the Congress and don't retire become lobbyists in Washington, D.C. It sends a terrible message, which creates cynicism, which feeds into the folks that don't want to get anything done. Washington will not fix itself. Mitch McConnell will not fix himself. It is something that wa- the country is going to have to come together in a unified way to overcome a broken Washington. And if that sounds hard to do, it's no harder than the work that generations of other Americans have done to try to perfect the democracy that we're living in. As you said the other day, it's totally true. What we are about is trying, and that's what we have to keep doing. We we have no right to expect it will be easy. It's never been easy to make this country more democratic, more fair, more free. It's always been hard, and our job is going to be hard, but it's going to involve every single one of us. You know, it's the opposite of a president who says, I alone can fix it. Let me ask you this. In the debates, there was definitely a moment where the crowd resonated with the message that you had, and that was... I think it was twofold. One part of it was was in and around what you just said now, coming together and fighting towards something as opposed to against each other in trying to get somewhere. But what was really interesting and important was you spoke about how you didn't want the Democrats to use similar tactics to Donald Trump in over-promising and under-delivering. You, you know, you had more practical measures that you were pitching on, on, on that stage. For instance, you said with health care, you, you still think there should be a private option. You said with health care, it should be fixed, but the, the, there's work that Democrats could do to give people a choice. It seems like you are more pragmatic. Some people have labeled you as more centrist, but you've said that this is more about promising things that are deliverable. Is that what you think voters want versus what Donald Trump did and said, ban all Muslims, build a wall, (laughs) bomb the shit out of them, just make it as big as possible? Why do you think that would sell to so many voters? He also was going to give us really cheap universal health care that you were really going to like, but he hasn't done that either. (laughs) Uh, Look, 
I am pragmatic in the sense that I believe that everyone's job is to make progress. And I also believe, and the older I get, I believe this even more, I don't think I have a monopoly on wisdom. I think that people in a republic like this have, are entitled to have disagreements. And I'm not entitled to believe that everybody's going to agree with my point of view, which means that I have to contend with people all the time that don't see the world the way that I do. Right. And it's out of that disagreement that we can burnish more imaginative and more durable solutions than, than if we came up on the ideas on our own. I mean, that's not the point of being an American. The point of being an American is we're working together to make more exciting and imaginative outcomes. The worst decisions I make in my, I don't know about you, but the worst ones I make are when I'm sitting alone in my house and not consulting anybody. That's about, when the ice cream happens. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, I Just know exactly to begin what, with. I Just know exactly what you're with. talking about. Yeah. And, and that's, and instead, if I'm with people who say, maybe you shouldn't eat another gallon of ice cream, uh -huh. then I'm less likely to do it. Definitely. Um, and that's what our democracy should really be like as well. And, and that sh it shouldn't be shameful that we have different ideas. What's shameful is that we don't make progress on these ideas. I don't view that as being moderate. I view that as, as being pragmatic and understanding that the kids that I used to work for when I was superintendent of the Denver Public Schools, you know, a large urban district in this country, have no time for this ideological battle that we're having. They can't fix their own schools. They can't fix our immigration problem. They can't deliver universal health care. They're too busy doing their work to study and get to a position where they can play a role in the democracy. They're counting on us to figure out how to resolve these disagreements and start begin to solve these problems for the American people. We have perfected the craft in our national politics of getting nothing done and blaming the other side. We are excellent at that. We don't need another 10 years of that. Thank you so much for being on the show. Senator Michael Bennett, everybody.